it, it is an honor to be your preacher. That's what they call me. I'm the preacher here today, though I feel like I'm just here to pay tribute like so many of the others have. I think they're just giving me the permission to go on a little longer <laughs> in doing that. And besides that, no American can really say John Stott properly. <laughs> and I'll try to, uh, uh, you know, so there's only so far I can go. When James uh, I. Packer, when J.I. Packer, did the memorial service for John Stott in uh, Canada um, earlier. He began with Hebrews 13, 7. Uh, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Uh, now, I've heard that in, in, often cited in many uh, memorial services, but I did some thinking about it, and I looked at that verse and this is not just a warrant for a eulogy. This is not just a it's, Of course, it's not talking about anything less than that, but he's talking about something more than words of praise. You know, the word remember your leaders, it's a progressive word that means something sustained uh, to consider the outcome of their way of life. The way of life, very comprehensive. The results of their way of life so that you can imitate it so that your life can be changed by it. And a couple of months ago when I was given the honor of, of this invitation, I started deciding I needed to re-examine my life in light of John Stott, who spoke the Word of God to me. I became a Christian as a college student in the late, in the late 1960s. Uh, Mark Knoll in his book, Faith and Criticism, points out that for almost two generations, maybe three, if you were a college-educated Christian, Orthodox Christian believer in America, and you wanted to read books that engaged your mind, answered your questions, you had to read British authors for almost two or three generations. And for, at the top of the, my list was John Stott. And his book, Basic Christianity, had a profound formative influence on me. Uh, he, he truly was, in some ways, the first person that spoke the Word of God to me, at least through his literature, and I also heard him in person. Uh, and therefore, I said, I need, to, I need to rethink. I need to do what, what, what Hebrews 13, 7 says I should do. I need to rethink my life in light of the results of his life. So I read six volumes on his life in the last two months, and I'd like to give you five findings. Uh, these are things that I believe are outcomes of his life, results of his life, that should change our lives. And even though I can see, because I, you know, I'm white-haired and I see an awful lot of the rest of you are white and gray-haired today, but I really hope the younger evangelical leaders would, would do the same thing, would remember him, would, would study the outcomes of his life, particularly in these five ways, and let their lives be changed by them. Here are the five things, five, the five findings. First of all, we need to be convicted by his kingdom vision. We've got to be convicted by his kingdom vision. When J.I. Packer spoke on this subject, he called it uh, John Stott's zeal for the kingdom. Uh, and, and Packer actually said, John Stott's entire life was an effort to banish apathy. Now, you could call him a man of vision. If you're a Tolkien geek like me, there you know there's one place where Gandalf is described in a particular way. And by the way, I, don't, I won't take it down that path, but to think about John Stott as Gandalf actually could be fruitful. <laughs> I'm not going to take you down that path. But at one point, this is what is said in the book about him. He was not just a lore master, but a great mover in the deeds of our time. See, most of us, we're lore masters, that means preachers, teachers. John Stott was not satisfied with doing that. He was not just a lore master. He wanted to do something world historical for Jesus. Uh, I, everything I've read, everything I've known, ev by all accounts, John Stott's motives were about as pure as a human being's motives can be, that, which means not perfectly pure. But he did not want ambition. He, he was not an ambitious man for his own glory. He did not want power. I mean, it's obvious. He did not want status. He did not want wealth. He gave it away. But there was something driving him he was probably the greatest student evangelist of his generation, but he did not see the same kind of conversions after the early and mid-1950s anywhere. In fact, nobody did. 
A lot of conversions in the 1950s, and then they kind of, uh, to those university missions, then they kind of trailed off. He, he filled all souls. It was the most successful um, a senior minister in, in, in Britain, and he took this church, this ordinary C of E parish, and filled it twice, morning and evening, and he did it through uh, terrific evangelism, and yet we know, if you read Our Guilty Silence, his book about evangelism that he wrote by the late 60s, he was willing to say, we haven't really reached our parish. He really wanted to reach the parish, the 10,000 people inside his parochial bounds. He, he did, by all, everybody else's standards, he was an incredible success. Oh, he, didn't, he didn't really reach the parish. He was certainly one of the leading reasons, maybe the leading reasons why the evangelical uh, wing of the Anglican Church in, in the UK has grown. But it's not a unified movement. It has not had as much of an impact. He, didn't, he, he wanted to reform the Church of England. He didn't just want to be a lobby. He wanted to win. He wanted to evangelize England. He didn't just want to be a successful church uh, pastor. And I would say, even though it's the one area of his life I actually know the least about, that when it came to his global ministry, which John Stott Ministries and Langham Partners uh, represents, it, it finally, after all the other efforts that he made to really do something world historical, do something game-changing for Christ, he foresaw the rise of Christianity in the global south before most anybody. And he got out there, and he saw the need for training. And his ministry, I think, has been a game changer. Here's, but here's my point. Most of the rest of us are, would be very happy being told, you're the best. You're the best preacher in the upper Midwest. You know, you're the best this, you're the best that. He just didn't care about that. He wanted to change the world for Christ. And, you know, I, I think over the years, I've gotten a little cynical about people that use that little phrase, do something so big that, uh, attempt something so big that it will fail unless God is in it. And I've heard so many people use that to raise money for their building program <laughs> that at a, certain, at a certain point I started to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I, I considered the outcome of his life and I looked at his motives and I looked at, at, at his labors and how he spent himself and how he gave himself why wasn't he ever satisfied? It really was not worldly ambition. He really wanted to change the world for Christ. He wanted to do something world historical. We should be convicted by that vision. We should give up our small ambitions. Okay, second finding. We should be cautioned by his cultural learning curve. This is not a criticism, by the way. Far be it. But we've already heard some references to this. As time went on, John Stott went out into the whole world and listened. He went out into Latin America and into Asia and Africa and he listened. He increasingly went away from the Western world and he went out there and he listened in a way that white Anglo people with his education just don't listen. And you can see it. All you have to do is read it. And this is, again, not a criticism. You can see him change. You can see the addition of uh, concern about social injustice and about, the con uh, about injustice and poverty in the world. You can see that grow. It wasn't there in his works in the 50s. It kept getting more and more. You can see his, uh, his understanding of what it meant to engage culture rather than just evangelizing souls. He changed. He grew in all ways that we're saying here are wonderful. But it, it does caution me because of a man that bright, that smart, that godly, that dedicated, could take years and years and years to, to, before some of his cultural blinders dropped off. I wonder what my problem is. I wonder what your problem is. You know, and, and, and you have to re remember that since most of us here are Americans, we're, even, we're, we're in a very bad position. We're in the middle of this enormous country. So if you're in Britain, you can look at the paper and see what's going on in the rest of the world. And if you're in America, you can't. I mean, because we are a world in a sense. But the, the fact is, you know, the joke in Europe is if you know three languages, you're trilingual. If you know two languages, you're bilingual. If you know one language, you're an American. <laughs> what does that mean? We really tend to, we live in our world. We're culturally myopic. Uh, for a man like John Stott to take years and years and years of getting out, getting around, listening to Christians in the other parts of the world to, to, to let them and essentially correct his understanding of the Bible, which was ultimately his authority, but which he wasn't reading as well 
in the beginning of his life as he was at the end of his life, wow, that should give us caution, pause. We should be cautioned by his cultural learning curve. Thirdly, we should be chastened. I'll be real fast on this one. We should be chastened by his leadership controversies. Here is the most ironic man I've ever, I've never known. Here's a man who is not by nature combative. Here's a man who is, we talked, you've heard people, you know, his friends up here talking about this, his, his, uh, his, his diplomacy. And yet, because he was a leader, because he was trying to do things world historical, he had the big falling out with John Stott. Uh, pardon me, pardon, yeah, sorry, with a big falling out with, with Lloyd-Jones. Lloyd-Jones, John Stott, the big falling out in the mid-60s. Um, many of you Americans don't know about this. Let me just say he had a falling out with nonconformist, uh, you know, non-Anglican evangelicals in the 60s. Uh, there was uh, Michael Harper and the, and the charismatic controversies. Uh, there was uh, Hell and J.I. Packer. There was Lausanne and Billy Graham and social justice or evangelism. A lot of you haven't heard that. I'm not going to spend any more time on it. I want you to know this. If a man as ironic as John Stott could not avoid controversy, could not avoid people being mad at him. And by the way, and by no means do, am I saying I necessarily think he came down on the right side of it, every one of those controversies. But I realize it's going to happen. If you want to do something for Christ, somebody's going to be mad at you. There are going to be controversies. We might as well not feel too much self-pity when we're in the middle of them. We just need to do what John always did, which is be as gracious and as, and as willing to look at himself and, and examine himself as possible and still tell, speak the truth in love. Fourth, so that's convicted by his kingdom vision, caution, for those of you taking notes, I don't know why you would, cautioned by his cultural learning curve, chastened by his leadership controversies. Now, here's what I like to dwell for a second especially for younger evangelical leaders. We need to be instructed by his great innovations. And let me give you what I, mean, what I mean by those innovations. I'll just give you four. One is, and I know somebody's going to say innovation, John Stott reinvented expository preaching. Uh, I'm still worried that younger evangelical leaders are increasingly thinking we need to get, we need to get beyond expository preaching. John Stott's expository preaching was really spartan. There are no stories. There are no illustrations. There's no humor. There's, and, yet, and yet, when John Stott came to America, and as people have talked about it already up here, there was this electrifying clarity. He, was, he would open the, the, the text, and you'd look at it and say, why in the world did I never see it? It's, it's as big as the nose on my face. You know, it's very big. Uh, how could I have missed that? I heard him expound a Sermon on the Mount when I was at gordon Conwell Seminary in 1973 and 1974, and it was, I, I've never gotten over it. Because there was none of, there was no, how do I say, there were no, there were no training wheels, there was no, there was no humor, there was no emphasis, there was no appeal to the emotions, there was no tear jerking, there was, it was just, I'm going to tell you what the text says, and it was electrifying, because it was so authoritative, because it was so clear, he kind of reinvented expository preaching and even though I don't suggest, you know, unless you are, you know, from, well, I don't, I don't suggest that Americans, for example, do it just the way he did it. But I, I, we would be stupid if we moved away from it because we think we need to get past it, because we need to get to the heart or something like that. John Stock got to the heart, and he was the most rational expository preaching, preacher I've ever heard because he was so good at opening the Word of God, which it... <laughs> Doesn't, you don't need to make it relevant, as people have said for years. It is a, it's alive and it's active. It's a two-edged sword. He reinvented, and he, I would say he kind of created a renaissance of expository preaching, and we need to continue to look at it. Second innovation. Some of you are going to say, of course you were going to get one minute in on this. He invented the modern center city church. Phil Reichen and I know something about this. The older approach to Center City Churches was Donald Gray Barnhouse or Lloyd-Jones. It was simply a preaching point. You just brought people in from everywhere. You could hear the great preacher, and it was hardly any community. John Stott, in the 50s, at All Souls, invented the modern Center City Church uh, ministry. It had parochial evangelism. It had guest services where you brought your friends once a month in the evening services, once a quarter in the morning services. You brought your friends to hear the gospel preach. They stayed afterwards. They... they, uh, there was people trained to do visitation. Uh, there, was the, uh, there was faith work integration. More and more as time went on, 
There was a, there was a concern about the poor. Slot was very concerned not to just have a comfortable middle-class congregation. He was concerned about the part of the parish that couldn't be reached culturally because it was working class. He started the, uh, the, uh, the clubhouse and things like that. There was a, it was a full service, center city ministry, balance of word and deed, balance of expository preaching and good theology and evangelism and social concern. It was unique, and it spread everywhere. And, you know, even though you don't think of John Stott as this big, big advocate of urban ministry, read the book of Acts, I mean, his, his commentary on the book of Acts, and you'll see uh, he was quite a proponent of it. Third, the, um, he was willing, as a lot of younger evangelicals are not willing, to organize and use institutions and organizations. What he did in order to, uh, as J.I. Packer said, put evangelical Anglicans on the map. Uh, the, uh, the, thing, the Eclectic Society for Younger Anglican Clergy, the, uh, uh, the, the Latimer House and the study, the, the, the study centers, uh, the, uh, the count, I think it was the Church of England Evangelical Council and other councils, too many for me to, to remember. Uh, well, he knew he was a statesman, and he was willing to, to create organizations and to work uh, with institutions in ways that the younger evangelicals today say, who wants to do that? But he made a dent that way. He made a difference that way. Fourth, J.I. Packer said that John Stott, and, and Chris Wright's already mentioned this, so I'll j- just to mention J. I. Packer said John Stott essentially forced evangelicals to deal with social ethics, social justice issues, things that for 50 years evangelicals just didn't want to deal with. And whatever you think of his formulations, we, we cannot stop dealing with them. And here's the last thing. I'll give you five. I believe John Stott, more than anybody else, created evangelicalism, which I see is is, is the great center between fundamentalism and liberalism. It was a wonderful project on the part of Harold Ockengay and, and Carl Henry and Billy Graham and people like that to say, look, over here is fundamentalism. We're intellectually disengaged. We're culturally disengaged, but we're orthodox. Over here is orthodoxy, liberalism, but, but they're engaged, but, but they're, not, they're heterodox. Here's liberalism. They don't have orthodoxy. They're, they're engaged, but they're not orthodox. They're orthodox, but they're not engaged. Let's have a middle space, evangelicalism, a place where orthodox in doctrine, high view of scripture, but intellectually engaged, culturally engaged. Who was it, though, that kept coming over here in the 50s and 60s and 70s to raise up all these young troops in inner varsity and other places? Who who was it that spoke at Urbana? Not Carl Henry, not Harold Ockengay, not Billy Graham, usually. It was John Stott, because he epitomized the middle space. He epitomized uh, absolutely rock rib uh, commitment to the authority of the Scripture and at the same time being utterly abreast of scholarship, absolutely involved, and yet at the same time accessible, bringing the scholarship down where it was accessible. He was the perfect creator of this middle space, which is, at least for the last 30 or 40 years, this has been the part of Christianity in the world that's grown the most, not fundamentalism, not liberalism, that space. He was prophetic from the center, and you can read it in The Cross of Christ, his book, his masterpiece, absolutely uh, firm on traditional substitutionary atonement, penal substitution, and yet he takes the implications of it and brings it to social justice and brings it to community. He's prophetic from the center, doesn't have to re-engineer traditional evangelical doctrine, but he engages with it. We can't forget these things. It worries me. An awful lot of younger evangelical leaders I know barely know what John Stott stood for. Here's one last thing. I'm done. The last thing I'd like you to do today is not just be convicted in these ways and instructed in these ways. I want you to be empowered by the knowledge of his present glory. We, we need to learn how to get joy and power from the knowledge of the people that we love who have passed away and know what they're like. Right now, do you get any power from that? Do you get any comfort from that? You should. You know, that place in the Tolkien, the Lord of the Rings, where Gandalf is described as, as being dead, he really wasn't dead. I feel that way about John Stott. You know, Dwight Moody, not Josh Moody, Dwight Moody was reputed to have said at one point something like this. He says, 
one of these days soon, you're going to hear that Dwight Moody is dead. Don't believe it. I'll be finally eternally more alive than I've ever been before. C.S. Lewis says at one point, he can make us the feeblest and filthiest of us if we let him into such dazzling, radiant, immortal creatures, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine, bright stainless mirrors which reflect back to God perfectly, though on a smaller scale, his own boundless power and delight and goodness. This process will be long and in parts painful, but when we get there, that's what we're in for, nothing less. John Stott wanted to change the world for Christ. He wanted, he, he wanted the light of Christ to flood the world. He wanted the knowledge of Christ to flood the world. And guess what? It's going to happen. He's escaped our shadows, and he's in the light. But the knowledge of his present glory should empower you to know and to, and to realize that we, he was on the right side and the world he was working for and the world we should be working for is inevitably on its way. He's in the light, we're in the darkness, but this darkness is going to be overwhelmed by the lights. There's, there's light and high beauty forever beyond the reach of the shadows are, that are here and that light and high beauty is going to flood the world and wipe out the shadows someday. John's going to come with it. All the people who are there now, are going to come with it. Be empowered by the knowledge of his present glory. Remember our leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcomes, the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Let's pray. Our Father, we briefly thank you one more time for not just the life of John Stott, but we ask that by your grace and by your spirit, you would help us not just to consider and think about these things, but be changed by who he was. Teach us how to imitate him. Teach us how to have his way of life become ours in so many respects. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.